right. You ever wondered, uh, church, get the sermon? Well, one small thing said from your wife. I'll tell you one thing, uh, at this church, that have a lot of character. Why should they are character? And but, uh, on the serious side, and that was funny, on the serious side, I was reading a description this week. A man that some people call the prince of preachers. And it was of Charles Spurgeon. And then when people were real, he would hold services. They could pack out 5,000 in the service. There's still not room for people in the auditorium. In the day, they didn't have internet, and they didn't have cell phones, the other kind of stuff, which probably was my kind of age in that uh, I do know how to text. I still text people once in a while, and people will text back and say, "Not you that must be Ruth text for you." I want you to know that your pastor knows how to text. If you believe that, well, I'm well just pray and dismiss the church. We have a lot of doubt here and unbelief in this house of God today. But as I'm reading a devotion, this verse that I'm going to preach today, uh, just just entered my and it just reached out and took control of me. So I tried to start another series on Christmas, but this is what the Holy Spirit would have me preach on today. In your Bible, in the book of Acts chapter 4 and verse number 13, now let me just give you just a little bit of background uh, of the story here. In the previous chapter, Acts chapter 3, in, Peter and John are on their way to the temple to pray, and there is a crippled man that makes a request of them. They reach out, they say, silver and gold have thy none, but such as I have, give I thee in Jesus, rise up and walk. The crippled man that ever been able to walk, now he can walk. They were amazed at what they saw. They saw this man. They knew this man. He was crippled, but now he's walking and he's leaping, jumping, and he's praising God. Well, you would think anybody would be excited. Now, the people get together, but the religious leaders, they were not excited. I mean, they actually... Peter and John in prison because to stir and an uproar from the crowd. And then in the book of Acts chapter 4 and the first 10 verses, there are 12 verses, Peter addresses those religious leaders. Now, I'm going to point out a word here in Acts chapter 4 and verse number 13. To get to it, I think you'll pick up on it. Acts chapter 4, verse number 13. And when they saw the boat, Peter and John, they and perceived that they were ignorant, they marveled in knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Who is the they there? It is the religious leaders that just weeks earlier had condemned Jesus Christ to be killed, to be crucified on the cross. So this congregation is talking about when it said, and they, unbelievers, Christ didn't, Christ rejected, and they held these two men, and it said something about these two men that I think help us in dancing our Christian. Let us pray. Bless this service today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Brother Dole, he, he does 
preached all around this good sermon that I'm going to preach today, and he really, he really set it up good for me. Let me just give you an opening statement based on verse number 13. Christians, Christians, Christ followers should be a reflection of Jesus Christ. As we live in this world, walk in this world, work in this world, or in this world, Jesus said, but thank God we are not of this world. We should be a reflection of Jesus Christ. Now, let's this out. You, this week, as a professed Christian, a professed believer, you should, and I should, have been a reflection of Jesus Christ. The question is this. What kind of a reflection did we have this week? Doyle talked about bitterness quite a bit in the school hour. Some of the most bitter people I have ever known are disillusioned Christians. Well, Pastor, I tried praying and it didn't work. I'm bitter about that. Well, Pastor, God took one of my little ones and God, I'm bitter about that. You and I as believers, blood washed, born again, children of God, that have God's divine nature living inside of us. We should be a constant reflection of who Jesus Christ is. Here's a great verse on this. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 says, now listen to this, listen to this verse. It says, as he is, Jesus Christ, so are we in this world. Think about that. As he is, so are we in this world. It was Gandhi and Doyle was right that, that somebody approached him how to become a Christian. And I think his statement was, he said, I was interested in Christianity. I mean, there was just something about Christianity that interests me. He said, and I might have become a Christian had it not been so-called Christians around. I wonder in my life, I wonder in your life, are we bringing people to Jesus Christ or are we turning people away from the Lord Jesus Christ? Let me give you another verse by on this, okay? Romans chapter 8. Verse 29, you know what Romans 8, 28 says, so that all things work together for good to them who are, who love God, to them who are according to his purpose. Now, what is God's purpose for your life and for my life? Based on Romans chapter 8, verse 28, here it is in 29, Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did pre Predestinate, predestinate what? Be conformed to the image of his son. This is God's purpose in my life as a believer. This is God's purpose in your life as a believer. That every be more and more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Here's a great verse also, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 2. Paul said, believers at Corinth, he said, ye, ye believers are our epistle written in our hearts and are known and read of all men. How many of you know that people read your life? How many of us read the life of others by the way they talk, by the way they act, by the way that they love and the things that they love? He said, you are known and read of all men. 
all men. Somebody asked a great preacher one time, what is the greatest version of the Bible that you've ever read? He said, it is the life of God's children that love him and know him and have the desire to serve him. You are our epistle written on the heart. You're known and of all. Now, I was reading in 1 John chapter 3. This, this verse came to my mind on this thing and said, they took knowledge of these disciples, Peter and John in particular, that they had been with Jesus. Listen to this verse. On the third chapter in verse 2, it said, when he shall appear, we shall be him. How many of you know that one of these days when Jesus shall appear, we are going to be like him? Why? Because we shall see him as he is. One day we're going to be like him. Why not begin to practice being like him right here on planet Earth? Psalms chapter 34 and verse 18, the psalmist said, The Lord is nigh to them that are of a broken heart. That's a great verse. Psalm 73, 28. The psalmist said, It is good for me to draw near to God. And one of my favorite verses on this thing about how close we should be to the Lord. James, the fourth chapter, and verse 8. Listen to this verse. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Now, he does implications of drawing near to God in that verse. He said, cleanse your hands, you sin, that's your outward life. Purify your heart, that is your word life. Every time I read James 4, 8, this great quote to my mind. Today, this moment, I am in Jesus Christ as I choose. You are as close to Jesus Christ as you to be. Far too many of God's people are like Peter, and he stood afar off. That is not God's will for his children. That is not a good testimony for God's children. Listen, we should not stand afar off. We should draw as we possibly can. And he mentioned areas that said, cleanse your your sinners, purify your heart. Because Proverbs 23 says, I'll keep thy heart with all diligence because of it comes. Whatever is in your heart not only comes out of your mouth, but it comes out of your life. Have you ever slipped and used Christian life? Now, we're not, hey, this is not altered the whole time because I'm afraid altars would be flooded. Uh, maybe maybe they have a problem with it. Honestly, yes. when I got saved, I could talk to where a sacred blush but it was just amazing what happened. When I received the very nature of God, 2 Peter chapter 1, when I became a new creature, Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become you. It's amazing. My life, that wasn't just a process, although I'm still in a process, God just took that away from me. I had a nasty habit. I was a heavy smoker. Now, I really didn't smoke. I was 
Us were on a day, man. It's a joke. Chelsea, have you heard that one before? You and I are as close to God right now as we choose to be. Let me ask you. How close to God are you right now? How close? In this question to ask God's people. Now, I want you to notice in verse 13. I'm going to break this down in four brief points. And we'll start with verse number 13. Look at the first part. Now, when they saw, now remember they, they are the religious Weeks earlier had condemned Jesus Christ crucified when they saw the boldness of Peter and John the same group that had put them in prison but when they saw Peter and John they something in John that the average Christian does not have yet it is available to Jesus Christ I want you to notice what it said and when they saw, what did they see? They saw the boldness of Peter and John. Let me define that word boldness. Now, one of my favorites found in here, the fourth chapter, verse 16, said, We can approach the throne of grace with what? Boldness. It means confidence, freedom to speak to God about anything we desire. You and I approach the throne. Whatever is on our heart, we have the free church, we have the freedom to be able to speak to him at the throne of grace because that's where we get grace. That's where we get mercy. So when they saw boldness of Peter and John. Your question. What courage do you display as a Christian? How much confidence do you display as a Christian? How much confidence? How how listen, how much do you have to speak about Jesus Christ? Uh, it's just something that's kind of developed in my life, uh, I go to the grocery store and there's an opportunity. I went to people. I came out of the department store the other day and a lady and we struck up a conversation and she was a military recruiter. Well, she said, well, Pastor, if you have anybody to join, she said, here's the card. So, man, that was a price. And this, I gave you, the, you gave me Card. Now let me give you something. And I begin to witness her about Jesus Christ. You and I should have a boldness, a courage, the confidence to speak freely about Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of us can speak freely about sports. How many of you like to watch sports? Now, Here's, here's what I heard on television this week, that they are thinking about giving Seattle a professional football team. Some of you, raise your hand. Because <clears throat> what I saw Thanksgiving, anyhow, let, let, hey, let's move that along, okay? <clears throat> we, can, hey, we can speak freely about football, boy, we can really get waxed bold about politics. What about the confidence and courage to speak about Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life, and that no man can come to God the Father by him. So, when they saw the boy, when people look at your life, can they see boldness? There's a great verse on boldness. 
Proverbs 28 and verse 6 says it this way. The wicked flee when no man doeth, but the righteous are old as a what? Lion. You know, righteous are as bold as a lion because we serve the lion tribe of Judah. Let me tell you something. When that lion roars in the jungle, it is not it is for another that he is still king of the beast. Chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Here's what Paul church. He said, pray for me. Verse 19. Pray for me that utterance may be given unto me. I may open my mouth boldly make known the mystery of the gospel. Verse 20. For which I am an ambassador upon, that therein I may speak boldly. You and I don't need to be timid at our faith. We need to be vocal and visible about our faith. If you happen to be around a group and they have profanity just come. I was in the military. I, I experienced that as a Christian. Take an opportunity to insert the word of God. You could even say something like, listen, before I come to know Jesus Christ that you've seen, I used to talk that way, but now that he has changed my life, I no longer talk that way. <clears throat> Acts chapter 4 and verse 31, listen to this. Acts 4, 31. Got your Bible open to Acts 4. Look at verse <clears throat> The Bible says, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they assembled together. And then I want you to listen to this. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. Did you get that? What is the recipe for boldness? He gives it number 31. When they had prayed, you find yourself timid about your faith, begin to pray. Pray for boldness. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they assembled, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. What if I just walked up to a regular member of Grace Baptist? today and I just put this question to you right now are you filled with the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit filling your life Ephesians 5 8 be not drunk with wine word is excess but be what glass filled with the Spirit you know what the word filled means it means controlled under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So, get verse 31 again. <clears throat> when they had prayed, they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and notice the results. And they spake the word of God with boldness. Could it be the reason we're not more bold than what we are? Our prayer life is anemic, and we are not under the control and the direction of the Holy Spirit. They saw the boldness. They prayed. They were filled. Spoke with boldness. Now look at verse 13. Back again. Acts 4.13. Look at the second phrase. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and, listen to this phrase, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. Not only did they see the boldness, but their perception in John were that they were unlearned and they were ignorant men. Both of these men were weak instruments. Can I just say this to you? 
That's the only kind of people that God can use. Paul said, listen, it is our weakness that draws God to you and I. Well, you're talking about two vessels that were weak. It was Peter and John. <clears throat> you remember Peter, don't you? Peter, you remember him? Remember him? What was his occupation before he He was what now? I Logan and Alpha said, I fish, therefore I love. <clears throat> Zach and I go fish once in a while. Well, quite a bit. And I'm telling you right now, it, it, this, it's one of the most amazing things I have ever witnessed in my natural life. When we first catch that fish, he's about this big. By the time we get home and tell everybody, he has, he has tripled in size. Hallelujah. Fishermen were known for their foulness in speech and their conduct of life. So they were not the most educated people in the world. John was not the most educated man in the world. And it says there in verse 15, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. Listen, it is not your education, and I'm not knocking education. I'm for it. I heard a preacher stand up one time bragging about the fact that he was educated. He didn't have to tell the con. You sense it right away when he I am not against education. Education without God just makes you a smart fool. What it but these men were unlearned. They didn't know the Greek. They didn't know the Hebrew like they should. And they were ignorant men. Boy, what a... By the way, it was not a compliment. They did not compliment. You should have noticed also in verse number 13. Look at it. Ephesians 4.13. 413, and they, they marveled. Have you ever lived in such a godly fashion, confidently and courageously for Jesus Christ, that people got the perception that there was something different in your life? You didn't look the same way. You didn't act the same way. You didn't talk the same way. You epitomize 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Those old things had passed away. And now the old things come. They just, listen, the word marveled means this. Uh, that crowd was amazed. They were surprised. Eyes. They were astonished. They couldn't figure them out. Now they couldn't deny the healing, and they couldn't deny the boldness. Said that they marveled. Some of the greatest that God used are people that the world considers unlearned and ignorant. And by the way, some scripture. Up. When you get time, just read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29. That's the pedigree of the people God uses. Not many noble, not many wise, but just uses normal, everyday human being. Just like sometimes about praying about taking a Sunday school class, or praying about this ministry in the church. And then they say stuff like this. I'm, I'm just not qualified. I, I, I wasn't born with the gift to gab. 
But if it's a subject that you like, you just miraculously receive that gift to gab. How many have grandchildren? Can I see? Can I see? Please. Spare me. Don't show me a picture of your grandkids, okay? Somebody said to me the other day, if I show a picture of my grandkids, I said, no, and I appreciate that very much. When you have grandkids, it's wonderful and gorgeous. As my grandkids, you don't need to look at anybody else's right? Now, how many folks with grandkids are going to leave the church after that statement? Raise your hand. offend anybody today, all right? Listen, we can talk about our grandkids. We can talk about our We can talk about everything. People are going to marvel if we talk about Jesus Christ. And then I want you to notice in verse 13. Notice the conclusion that these Christ deniers and crucifiers they came up with. Let me read the whole verse, the gist of the last verse. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were unlearned and men, they marveled, and listen to this phrase. Here's the phrase. Give me in the office. Quickly began to do some research on this. Look at it. And they took knowledge of them. Now we know it was knowledge of their high. It was not. Or they took knowledge of a religion pedigree. No, no, no. That's not what they took knowledge of. What did they take knowledge of? You probably already know the answer. They took knowledge of them, what? That they been with Jesus. Can I say that again? That they had been with Jesus. I kept reading that phrase there. They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. When people observe you and I as Christ followers, do they take knowledge? We have been with Christ. Here's a little quote that I came up with this week. To be much for Jesus we must be much with Jesus. Remember the phrase that I said? Today, you and I are as close to Jesus Christ as we want to be. Now, conclusion that they had been Jesus Christ. Here's a great verse. Acts chapter 17, verse number 6. He's un. Ignorant, all band of believers, Scripture says in Acts 17, 6, and when they found them, not, they drew certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down. When's the last time you turned the world upside down? When's the last time you witnessed somebody? When's the last time? Your faith knowledge of them have been with Jesus. Parents, parents, to me for a minute. Children see you on a day-to-day -day basis. Your spouses see you on a day-to-day -day basis. Can they honestly say that he's been with Jesus. She's been with Jesus. They've been with Jesus. Can they honestly say that? Now, you that thought that was my last point, that was just my introduction, okay? Now, this explains the boldness of the early believers. Peter, 
Peter. What he talks about Peter and John. When he got under fire and he was accused of being one of Christ's followers, he said, I don't even know this man. I want you to know same Simon Peter. Day of Pentecost preached the gospel and thousand souls got saved. What was the difference? And with Jesus Christ. I just want to give you six thoughts here by way of closing up. Characteristics of those who have spent Jesus Christ. Six characteristics of those that have time with Jesus Christ. Let's see, let's see how you and I match up. About first John, John chapter one, verse fourteen. The Bible says the word was reference to Jesus Christ. Well among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only of the Father, full of grace and what? Truth. Let me ask you a question. To be a Christ follower, you profess to have been blood of the Lamb. You profess to be a child of God. Are you full of grace and truth? What about your speech? Do you speak? Is it seasoned with grace? What about the way that you yourself on a daily basis? The way that you respond to others. Are you graceful? Are you gracious? Do you speak the truth? Um, well, he was full of grace and truth. He was, and as he is, so are we in this world. Here's another one. First, one verse number fifteen and sixteen. Pick up on this one. Uh, this is the second of Christ followers. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. But as he which has called you is holy, so be in all manner of conversation. Conversation there doesn't mean just the way you talk. It is your manner of life. Look what he said. So be ye holy all inner conversation. The way you deal with the unsaved, are you holy? The way you deal with your immediate family, are you holy? The way you deal when you approach somebody that's unsaved, are you holy? And listen to verse 16. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Are you separated unto the Lord? So he was full of grace and truth. You and I should be full of grace and truth. He was holy, you and I should be. Christian, listen to me for a minute. There should be a distinct difference between the believer world. Say that again. There should be a visible difference between the believer and this world. You and I may be the only Bible that the unsaved will ever, ever read. When they look at our life, can they tell that we have been with Jesus Christ? All right, let me give you the third one here. Matthew chapter 9, 36. Full of grace and truth, should we be? 
He was holy, so should we be. Matthew 9, 6. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with what? Say that word out loud, class. Compassion. He saw, the, saw this multitude as they really were. Here's a great question to really emphasize. When you and I behold the ungodly, living such an ungodly life, are we moved to temper or are we moved to tears? Like one great preacher said in the past, but for the grace of God, what class? There go I. We that have been saved for a while, we get irritated the way unsaved people. Let me just give you a great thought. Unsaved people act like they're saved because they are unsaved. We're never going to win if we act like they do. Can people tell that we have been Jesus Christ? Are you compassionate? He was. Let me give you another one. Are you forgiving? Are you forgiving? Two little boys got in a scrap and they friend a long time. And little Johnny come walking in the house and his mom said, well, Bobby were playing. He said, me and Bobby's not friends anymore. She said, what? Told her what? I got my toes off. Well, later that afternoon, Bobby came back over and Johnny was out there and they were just like nothing had ever happened. So his mother called him in the house and said, what happened? I thought you were done with Bobby. You know what he said? I said, Mom, we're forgivers. We're forgivers. Jesus Christ was forgiving. As he is in this world, so are we. Forgiving God. One great writer says, he that will not forgive others burns the bridge over which one day he himself will have to cross. Let me give you the verse on that. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Jesus Christ is on the cross, suspended between heaven and hell. There are his accusers. There are his killers. Listen. Then said Jesus, what did he say? What did he say? You say, well, Pastor, I, I, I just can't forgive this person. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been that on the cross? He ever spit in your face? Nobody ever said that what you do, you do by the power of Satan. They did that to Jesus Christ. Yet he was what? He was forgiving. This thought there. And then let me give you, let me give you another verse on that. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Go all around this good sermon. Ephesians 4, 30 through 32. And greet me. The Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed to the day. Let all bitterness and wrath, anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Here's the phrase I want to get to. One to another, tender hearted, forgive one another. How? Who's your example? Even as God Christ takes. against you. It wasn't as bad as they did to Jesus. Yet he forgave. 
And then here's another one, and I'll close with this. Mark chapter 10, verse 21. Jesus was loving. How loving are you? How do you express your love? It says, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. John 13, 35. What? That you preach a good sermon? That you love one another. Let me read the text of Mark chapter 10, verse number 21. Jesus had the conversation with the rich young ruler. I said to him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, well, you know the, you know the commandments. And that young man, all these have I kept up. He was a self-righteous individual. And what the Bible says in Mark 1. And Jesus is holding him. What? That he loved him. He loved him. A great writer one time said, that what was said about the early church that made a difference in their society, oh, how they loved each other. If you and I cannot love our brother whom we have seen, we ever whom we have not seen. Here's a question. How's your love life, Christian? How'd you love? Do you love people? I tell any young man who thinks about going into the ministry, I tell him this. If you don't love people, people with all, all kinds of shortcomings, don't love people. You're not ready for the ministry. You say, well, pastor, are you trying to tell me that you love everybody? Church, probably better not say that today, all right? Should. I should. I want to. You know how I can tell that I have not with Jesus like I should? When I begin to get critical, everything. Anybody here today have ever been, I mean, you just set aside at least one day a week, and that is your day to be critical. Anybody ever do that? You don't just set it aside. It just, it just jumps on you. Like he told me one time, he said, Pastor, uh, I don't need to pray, Lord, lead me not temptation. I already know the way. Self becoming critical. Critical of this. Critical of that. It's just, it's just everything. And as a blood washed child of God, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will speak to me and say, You need to spend some time with Jesus. You need to spend some time with him. Get as close to him as you possibly can. So he said, those six characteristics. He said, Jesus was, so should we be. Was holy, so should we be. He was compassionate, so should we be. He was submissive to his will, to the Father's will, so should we. He was more forgiving, so should we. More loving, so should we. What's the conclusion? Verse 13, I'll close with this. Act 4. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they that they were unlearned 
ignorant men, they marveled, they took knowledge of them. They had been Jews. This past week, in your encounter with humans, could they take knowledge that you had to this point? Could they? Could they? By your example as a Christian, could they influence? Toward Christianity or away from Christianity. Let's bow our first step. The eyes closed, the Christians praying. Head bowed, eyes closed, Christians praying. <clears throat> now I know that this has been a pointed, convicting message today. Just remember this, I've had to digest the sermon all week. You just got it fresh today. When people look at my life, can they tell that I have been with Jesus? When people look at your life, can they tell that you've been with Jesus. If you want to be more like Jesus, you have to spend more time in the Word. Anita plays very softly and in the verse. I want you to think about this for a Anybody ever said to you be after a little rant that you had in your life? Uh, and I thought you were a Christian. I thought you were a believer. I thought you were a churchgoer. That's ever happened, man. Can that be convicting? I wonder if someone here today and you say, Pastor, God spoke to my heart. And I acknowledge today by the word of God that I'm not as close to Jesus Christ as I should be. I'm merely as close as what I want. The Holy Spirit of God spoke to your heart today. Would you slip up your hand? Let me see it. God. You know what? We we are here, and it's a place to come and put your all on the altar and leave this today saying pastor I want people when they look at my life to tell that I've been with Jesus while we just pray very softly if you're a child it's your heart's desire that's your prayer why don't you slip out right now don't hesitate slip out right down to the nearest aisle make your you say pastor are you trying to put me on a guilt trip to get you off. I'm trying to get you off. Have you been with Jesus this week? Have you spent some time with him? Have you taken time to be holy? Listen, if you, if you really cannot kneel, you got your way down front, uh, just say, Lord, I determine today that I'm going to spend more time with you. I'm going to spend much more time with you, Lord. There's many others that should have come, but your pride has kind of gotten the best of you. And I tell you right now, if you are and you haven't been with Jesus this week like you have not. Now these are still praying. I wonder if there's any 
it would say, I'm not even sure that I know Jesus as my personal Savior. I'd like to know that I'm not even sure. Pastor, if I die right now, I don't even know where I'd go. Did you lift long enough to see it? Can I see it? If you are watching by live stream, let me just quickly but thoroughly take Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You must God that you are a sinner. That you have sinned against God. That you're a sinner. You must believe that Jesus Christ came to this cursed earth, lived a free life, died on an old rugged cross, was buried and rose again for your and then you must confess him as your Lord and Savior. Jesus today knowledge my son. Believe that you died on the cross for my sin. And today I as my Lord and my Savior. You say, preacher, is that to it? That's it. That's it. You can walk out of this building. As we conclude this service, sure that you're on your way to heaven. All right, you may be seated very quietly. <clears throat> I'd like for you to church members and the guests to just read Acts 4.13 once a day. They took knowledge of them they had been with Jesus. Now, I am very proud to announce that we are a member of Grace And I cannot wait to continue this member up close. Vincent, would you, would you and your little wife just come? I want you to notice how Vincent is holding this treasure. Am I correct? Vincent Jr., come around up here. I promise we're not going we're not going to make we're not going to make a of you. And I want you to look at this little guy. Look at him. He does not have a care in this world. You know anything about children? The most beautiful daughters, uh, not quite as beautiful as daughters. I mean, I mean, they are just gorgeous. Vincent's a military guy. Now listen, for all you military, I can't tell you how much I love you. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your sacrifice. But little Vincent, he seems to be okay now, right? All right, he had a little bit of a breathing problem. That's why Mama has been close to him. And if you listen, you know what her daughter looks like? They look just like her. Vincent, that's a little look just like her. Listen, I am so excited. When I saw you walk in, I was so excited. Then I saw you. little Vincent Jr. Right. I don't know. Is it okay if people come by and look at it once we dismiss the service? Or would you people not be close to us? Okay. All right. Well, just, hey, you don't get to look at him like that. Just stay away from little Vincent Jr., okay? All right. Okay? You may go back. All right. We're going to pray. <clears throat> what a blessing. What a blessing. Let me just conclude with this. I did not have a wife and children when I served in the military. Feel the heartbeat. A wonderful, something does come up, and your husband cannot be there. So I want you to know this, 
that you are not only welcome at Grace Baptist, you are honored at Grace Baptist. How many of you thank God for our military? Give him a big hand, all right? All right. Brother James, why don't you come up? How do you pray today? Okay. Well, come on up, then you should be primed and ready. Pray and ask the Lord to bless the food. Choir, please go eat. Ten minutes after we dismiss, hey, if you're the choir and you're going to go eat, get down and go eat, okay? All right. Choir's going to eat. All right. So anyhow, so I want you ten minutes because our Christmas cantata is in three weeks, so we'd really need some time preparing. I also need to play the music today, so hang around for a little bit. That'll be so we can work on it. All right, James. Ask the Lord to bless. I'm sorry, Dawn. Right. Okay, listen, let me comment on that. Um, we have in the church that are good people. When it comes to Christmas, you don't have sufficient funds to stuff with the children. So, where's children? I tell you, would you raise your hand? Raise your hand. They're sitting on the very back row. And uh, so listen, you're not going to have time to go shopping. You have no idea who it is. In. So just go by Bell and give her some cash. And I promise you, Chelsea, she can squeeze blood out of the kernel. She really can. And she will do anything for the children and for the family that have a need this Christmas, okay? All right, thank you, Dora, for reminding me. Amen. Bell, I'm not giving you. 